that are also online with us today. This is a special day. It is a special moment to be back in this space. We know in a whole new way, like we've never really viscerally known before, that the church is not the building, right? right. And yet, our bodies have a visceral memory of spaces wherever we are. And we have 
experiences in this place that are meaningful and memorable and powerful. And we have experiences of God and the spirit working in our lives in this space. And so the association is powerful. It may bring up feelings of joy, maybe tears of joy. It may bring up some feelings of grief as you realize that you missed this space and being with one another. It may be brand new for you. Maybe you've never even been in this space before. And so it's just all open and fresh and waiting to see what it's going to be. Um, no matter what it is, whether you're at home, whether you're here today, we are God's people together. And you belong here. You have a place here. You are needed and loved and welcomed here. And it is good for us to be together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So because this is our first time back after, gosh, what seems like an eternity, um, a couple of logistical details just to go through before we begin our worship. Um, because a whole lot of what's going on today is new for those of us who have been planning and organizing. A special word of thank you to the church council who organized everything so well for our entrance. Didn't they do a great job? And they have done a great job for the last year trying to anticipate needs and setting things up well for us. And I really want to say a hearty thank you to our church council members. You've done a great job. Um, the obvious thing, of course, is our masks. That we know for a fact that masks help keep each other safe, and we want to be together in a way that keeps everyone safe. So please, no matter whether you feel great about masks or whether you hate them, please keep them on over your nose and mouth throughout the whole service with the brief moment of when we take communion as the only exception. I, I know some people that it's uncomfortable or you wish you'd rather not have to do it, but in this space and in this time, and even when we're outside together, if you would just commit to caring for your neighbor in that way, we will all be safe together that way. We have some new technology that you may have noticed. Our bulletin is not gonna be a paper that's passed around hand to hand, but it'll all be on the screen, the order of worship. So just follow along. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing, you know, let me know. Raise your hand. Feel free to try to move in a socially distanced kind of way if you need to, to be able to see the screen okay. Um, if you are at home and you're having any trouble with the Zoom, just try to send a chat to Mary Anthony. She should be sainted, canonized, I think, when it comes to technology. <laughs> We are hugely indebted to a year and a half plus of you keeping us connected digitally. So thank you so much. So having said that, this is the first time, other than the run-throughs, that we are using whole new technology, whole new software, not what we've been doing for the last year and a half. So please be patient if there's glitches or the screen doesn't match up exactly, just give us a minute. Um, we're all in this together and uh, your patience will be greatly appreciated. If you have any trouble on Zoom, send a message to Mary via text or chat, okay? Just chat. Chat or text. Chat or text. Either one is okay. And speaker B for those. Oh, thank you. And for those of you who are on Zoom, it will be best if you put your Zoom uh, screen on speaker view. Um, gallery will make what you see on the screen too small for you to read. But speaker view should do just fine. And if you don't know what, how to do that, top right corner, click on the box of boxes, and it will show you views, and then you pick speaker. Okay. Following the worship service today, everyone is invited to go outside on the lawn where the benches are, and we have a big banner that says, home sweet home, <laughs> to celebrate this day. 
and I invite you all to go there and have your picture taken. That will help us to create the beginnings of a brand new digital um, directory for the church. So no matter what, just go take your picture. It doesn't matter how your hair looks or what your dress looks like. We're just celebrating being together, okay? Um, and then as you take communion today, we will be seated in our regular spaces. You should have all received a communion package when you walked in. If you didn't, um, ushers, would you mind asking some of the folks that have gloves on to bring a few communion packages in in case anybody didn't? Is there anybody that didn't get a communion package? Yeah, okay. Well, well Connie, we'll get you one. So glad to see you guys. Um, Bob, would you take a communion package over to Connie over here? Thank you. Connie, can you raise your hand so Bob can see you? Okay, thanks. So one end of that communion package has a wafer in it, and the other end opens up into the grape juice. And, and they're all grape juice today. Um, it's going to be that way for a while because, well, it's very the details about supply chain issues these days. But we're, we're, we're dealing with juice for a while. So, um, and if you needed a gluten-free wafer, the gluten-free ones are on the table. Um, we, the ushers can get a few more too. Is anybody that needs gluten-free that didn't get it? Okay, good, excellent. Everybody's got what they need. So on your way out the door, there's a trash can for the packaging from your communion and the communion and the offering plate is on a table on your way out the door. Rather than pass offering plates, which of course could pass germs along with it, the offering plate is just sitting there for you to put your offering in on your way out the door. Okay, enough of the logistics. We're going to do one more thing to get ready for worship before we actually begin to worship, and that is learn a song, right? Of course we're going to learn a song when we're coming back together, right? Lisa wouldn't have it any other way, and it's just so much more fun that way. So the choir is going to teach us um, uh, the sermon hymn a little bit um, so that it's familiar for us before we begin our worship time. And thank you so much to John Magnuson, who is filling in for Betty. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Betty is probably anticipating being back with us in the beginning of December. So we're just so appreciative of that. Thank you, John. And so thankful to the choir who has been so diligent and fabulous and wonderful for all this time recording at home and sending things um, to Betty to be mixed and um, Lisa for organizing and getting people coordinated and learning things by Zoom. Oh, you all have been amazing in, in all this time. Just amazing. Yes, and one, one last fun thing. We decided that part of the benefit of um, being together is that we can have lots of different ways to connect and express our joy and our um, a sense of connection and the sense of the movement of the spirit. And so Lisa has made sure that there is some kind of musical instrument in every pew rack. It might be an egg or a maraca or it could be any number of things. Might be one of these symbols or a little baby one. Um, Any time in the in the service that you feel the spirit moving, you feel free to express your Thanksgiving that way. Um, and and any time during the music that you want to engage, um, it, it gives us more of a full body experience of worship. And after so long of not being able to touch and, and see and be with. The, the instruments give us just another way to connect. So I invite you to make friends with whatever instrument you got, you know, by random selection, and, um, and feel free to use it throughout the service. And it will be there for Sunday after Sunday, and we will sanitize them in between so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and just enjoy yourself. Okay. words up for the sermon hymn. Oh, I am so sorry. 
or we can learn the words. It's about maybe this, it's like slide 32. The yeah. song we're going to learn is based on Micah 6 8. What does the Lord require of you? Um, so the first, there's three parts. We're going to end up singing this in a round because this is a wonderful way to learn new ways of singing together and how our voices will just support each other and intermingle. So the, the first, there's part one, there's part two, and then there's part three. Part one is what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? That is, this side is actually gonna end up singing part one. What does the Lord require of you? You have it memorized already. Part two is justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. So justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. Part three is going to be led today by Kirsten and Katie because the, the music of it is a little bit trickier, but if you want to sing it, go for it. And that one is to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. This has been looping in my head. It's a great, it's, I just love the fact that this is now what's kind of filling my, my head. Oh, there's the words, everybody can see it. So we're going to sing part one twice, part two twice, part three twice, and then we're going to try singing it as a round. This side part one, that side part two. The uh, bass section is going to lead this side of the church in part one. Part two. Part two. part two. part two. Sorry, part two. This, uh, Lynn, the, the soprano alto and tenor section here is going to be this side in part one, as, and I'll be doing part one too. Okay, and these guys are going to do part three. If you want to sing with them, Linda, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, hit it. <laughs> Preparation for worship. Now we will begin to prepare our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our bodies to engage in the experience, the holy gift of worship. We have some singing to talk about. Thank you. 
Would you please stand as we share together in a time of confession and forgiveness? We bring our whole selves before God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But with our sincere repentance and by the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes us righteous, not perfect, but in right relationship to each other and to God. So receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sin. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We sing our own communion. To make following you our highest aim, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I don't see any children for children's time today, so I think we'll just continue with the reading of the lessons. 
The first lesson today is from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the fourth verse. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall seek his offspring and shall prolong his days through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall be light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 91 responsibly. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, and the Most High, your habitation. No evil will befall you, nor shall affliction come near your dwelling. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion, cub, and viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. I will deliver those who came to me. I will hold them because they know my name. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With, with long life will I satisfy and show them my salvation. The second lesson is from the fifth chapter of Hebrews, beginning with the first verse. <laughs> Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And, when, and one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, 
just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he was suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God, a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel affirmation. from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. For all these months, I have felt so trapped by preaching from a chair. It's the only way I knew how to get the camera and everything to work. Now it feels so weird to be standing up. <laughs> For several weeks now, we have been hearing story after story after story of Jesus 
trying to tell his early disciples what kind of Messiah he is and what it means to follow him. Week in and week out, we have heard how Jesus announces, I'm headed to Jerusalem, and there I will suffer at the hands of the powerful, and then I will die, and then I'll be raised again, and then you'll see what God is doing through all of this. And the disciples are there with him. They know his routines. They know his sense of humor. They know his serious face and his serious face, <laughs> right? They have been living with him and they know him. And they're with all that familiarity still, they don't really get what he's about. They don't understand what he's trying to teach them. I'm headed to Jerusalem. Oh, no, you're not, Peter says. Jesus snaps at him and says, get behind me, Satan. And then he heals a blind man. I'm headed to Jerusalem. Okay, but which one of us is going to be the greatest among you when, when it's all said and done? Like, can, can we all be, you know, which one of us will be? And Jesus just shakes his head, heals another blind man. Jesus says, I'm headed to Jerusalem. And today we have James and John, and they're focused on how they can leverage this moment for a position next to Jesus of honor in his glory. I mean, can we even begin to wrap our minds around how they are imagining this experience? They, they have in their own life experience the understanding of what royalty is like, so they're picturing Jesus at this incredible banquet table and, you know, seated like a king and a queen would be. And they want to know, can I be on your left or your right? The two most honored positions in this incredible scene of what glory is like. But can we even begin to understand what it is that they're ignoring? She's, Jesus says, I'm going to go be tortured and suffer and go through this incredible pain that's associated. Everyone would know that being dying on a cross would be associated with an incredibly horrific death. And the disciples are just skipping right past that and saying, well, what's in it for me? Like, can we even begin to wrap our minds around how these disciples don't get it. Can you imagine a friend telling you, you know, I'm, I'm headed into this COVID infested refugee camp to take medicine to the sick and I likely won't be coming back alive, but God will be with me. And then your response is, hey, um, when you get to that banquet table, that heavenly banquet table, can you save a spot for me? <laughs> really? <laughs> but Mark, Mark is very intentional in the way he tells the story. He uses the disciples as an example of both people who are sincerely dedicated and desire to follow Jesus and who just keep not getting it. So on the one hand, we can identify with the disciples because we have that sincere heart, right? We want to follow Jesus. We want to get what Jesus is telling us. And we also know that, well, maybe sometimes we just don't get it, right? Sometimes we just aren't paying attention or we're following, focusing on the, you know, what's in it for me part. He keeps trying though. Jesus keeps trying. He's committed to making sure the disciples understand what it means to follow them, even when they keep not hearing him. And I think the, the power of the scriptures is that those, it's not just those 12 disciples, it's maybe the human condition. And we have, we have the scriptures 
that tell us these stories to help us to get it maybe a little better. You know how when you're not the first child in the family, you get to watch how the first child does it and go, oh, okay, that gets you in trouble, so I'm going over here. Scriptures kind of serve us in that way, right? Those first disciples, they didn't get any heads up. We, we get the whole picture laid out for us so that we can see a little bit more clearly. Over and over again, the disciples are invested in what we would call today their egos and their greed or their, their sense of turned in on themselves, as Luther would say. It might seem oversimplified, but stay with me for a moment on this. If you've ever tried to learn Christian meditation, or frankly, any style, of meditation for that matter. You know how quickly, once you sit down and get comfortable and pay attention to your breathing, how quickly your thoughts turn to distractions. Anybody? <laughs> oh yeah. To what sound is going on outside, to what the birds are doing, to what you forgot to put on your to-do list or your grocery shopping or what you're about to make for dinner, what you neglected to do at work. It isn't easy to learn to focus our thoughts or to empty our minds of those distractions, to embrace the silence of the presence of God. And in part, that's because our egos tend to run our lives. Our egos resist submitting to God, to being silent, to anything or voice or message that tells us what to do. Put on a mask, you can't make me, right? Isn't that our first reaction to most things when somebody tells us what to do? In part, we struggle with these stories and with the issues in our lives because they take away some, or we think that they take away some sense of our power or our agency or our sense of control. And if we look at the stories that we've been hearing for a couple of months now, with an eye toward what is it that causes the disciples to resist or to refuse to hear Jesus. It's easy to see what a powerful role our ego and our greed play in, in all throughout history. Peter couldn't begin to tolerate the notion of a suffering Messiah. Jesus kept saying it over and over again, but that's not a powerful image. That's not a person that you want to follow. You want to be associated with a winner, right? So, but Peter, oh my goodness. He, had, he wanted somebody to ride in on that white steed and overthrow the Romans. His ego was offended at what Jesus was saying and he couldn't and he wouldn't hear it, at least not right away. When the disciples ignore that journey that Jesus describes that is so very costly, the journey of suffering, they can't stay with Jesus in that image. They just push past it and get move forward onto that moment of glory. Um, yeah, Jesus, Jerusalem, yeah. But then after that, could you maybe put me up there in front of everyone so everyone knows that I knew you from the beginning, that I was one of the originals, that I'm really an important person in your inner circle? Can I be seated next to you so everyone will see me? Ego, just pure ego. And remember the rich young man just last week, so intent on doing everything right so that he can get into heaven and have God's eternal favor. And Jesus says to him, live out the commandments and do everything in your power to take care of the poor. And when he hears that last part, he's so devastated. 
And he just walks away as if changing his perspective is entirely out of the question. His ego and his greed wouldn't even begin to let him hear Jesus. We don't talk so much in the church about the power of sin anymore, especially associated with the drive of our egos and our greed, because in large measure, I think in our society, these, these human characteristics are celebrated. They're lauded and applauded in so many areas of our lives that we're ambivalent about whether or not they're actually problematic. Mega churches grow by refusing to talk about a suffering Messiah, just like in our stories. Jesus' mission to the poor and the powerless is nowhere near as attractive as you're going to be rich and wealthy and blessed. And instead, glory becomes the focus. Wealth and power in the name of Jesus, but Jesus would not likely recognize that message as his own. It's hard for us to swim upstream as Christians and think about how do I need to check in on my ego and my greed? Because those things are not talked about in terms that would suggest correction in most of our society. I found myself reflecting recently on so many of the struggles that we have in, the, in our society today and the divisions associated with them. And it occurred to me that so much of the quagmire that we find ourselves in is rooted in these same struggles of ego and greed that tripped up the early disciples. You know, they say not much has changed under the sun, right? Years ago when I was in Tanzania, I was talking with a coffee farmer. He had struggled with poverty his whole life and all of the chronic conditions that are associated with poverty. And he said to me, when you go back, tell your people what you've seen here. Tell them what life is like for us because surely at least the Christians, if they knew, would do something about our condition. They would never let this be this way. They must not know. You have to tell them. And I remember feeling like I was crying inside because hearing his sincere plea for help, what struck me was that I knew that if it was just a question of information, the situation would have already been rectified. People do know about poverty around the world. But it's, it's so much more than just simply not having the information. We are a nation of rich young rulers who find it hard or to even imagine changing our perspectives or our lifestyles for the sake of others that we don't know and don't, don't personally know. When we talk about serving fair trade coffee at our fellowship time, it is this man and his family that we are caring for when we make that commitment. But how quickly we choose to save a few dollars instead. Our egos tell us to take care of ourselves and our budget and our greed prevails, and he simply fades into the background of our purview. It isn't just a matter of information. If the sin of racism were simply a matter of being taught to value and honor every single life, there would be no racism in the world, right? Think for a minute about what this means. If every single person just made the choice today to value every single other human being that they need, effective tomorrow, there would be no more racism, right? Could it be that simple? Of course it could. But what keeps us from eradicating racism is our egos and our greed. 
It's our egos because human beings have historically always found a way to create hierarchies where one person is over another, has more power over another. And in some cases, we make money off of that, which gives us much more reason to keep that racism in place. Ego and greed, the root cause of slavery, long before the time of Jesus, and even then more brutally in the 1600s with the African slave trade, ego and greed. So today, if we want to dismantle racism, we have to confront our own investment in it, our own egos, and our own investment in systems of greed that keep the benefits of racism in place. If it was a matter of knowing right from wrong, we could end racism with an education campaign and racism would be gone tomorrow. It would be something we would read about in the history books. So while we can't manage everyone else's egos or greed, we can, can take a moment and check our own to listen to the voices of our egos and our greed and to pay attention to where we are invested in the things that God would be appalled by. Prejudice of any kind, for any reason, we need to ask ourselves, what would it take to dismantle it? Where are we invested in it, in our egos or in our finances? And how easy these issues would all evaporate if we were able to channel our egos into following that suffering servant that Jesus was trying to explain to us, to channel our resources into the work of that suffering servant, individually and as a society. Mark's whole gospel carries this message that to follow Jesus isn't about getting the goodies of glory. It's about being to willing to live as Jesus lived and ready to do whatever we're called to do, no matter the cost. A suffering Messiah leads us to go where the healing is needed, where the hurting can be heard, where injustice can be chipped away at until it no longer has the final say. There's a comfort for us in coming back into this space. And I want to encourage us to think about that comfort as if this is the place where Jesus gathers the faithful who have the desire of their hearts, of our hearts, to follow Jesus, to learn to listen to Jesus, so that we can go out and do what Jesus is calling us to do. This is the hospital space where we come for healing and comfort, where we come to have our hope restored and our spirits renewed and re-energized for the other six days of the week where we are the people that follow a suffering servant. We need this place. We need this day. We need this time together, whether it's online or in person, so that we can be filled up with God's goodness for the sake of that work that Jesus calls us to do. This is the time and the space where we drink in that moment of truth that helps us check those egos, where we drink in the power of forgiveness and enables us to let go of the fear behind our greediness, where we Drink in the love that God has for us as God's arms are wrapped around us, where we drink in the promise that God will walk with us no matter what, as we honestly face 
those moments where we are challenged to rethink our perspectives on things, to become more faithful, to align our lives more as God would have us, to drink in all the reminders that in each other and in this place and in the Spirit of God, we have everything we need. Ultimately, there is nothing we can take with us from this life into the next, except a heart that is devoted to God. So I want to invite you to drink in the freedom that comes with being open to what God has for us, to really listen to Jesus, to have our minds be open to being changed, to have our expectations be rewritten, to be willing to take God's hand and be led, to drink in the freedom and the joy of the reminder of God's grace in this place so that we are strengthened to leave it once again, to do God's work. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And may we be like those early disciples, but who have heard the gospel, so that Jesus' voice can be louder in our lives than those voices of ego and greed that surround us. Amen. As a reminder, we'll sing our round, part one, part two, part three. But first, we're going to sing it all together. So we're going to sing part one, part two, part three, and then round three times. One, two, three. Next to us, the Lord, we Holy One, for the gift of the church handed down through the ages, and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus, we praise you. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministry in its many forms, and equip them with your gifts. Hear us, O God. 
I will. <laughs> Creating one. For the lush and abundant habitat you provide for all your creatures, we praise you. Provide healing for the earth so that waterfowl, reptiles, wild horses, dolphins, and all living things flourish as you intend. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Suffering one, for all who work toward peace and who lead nations with a servant's heart, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. As our nation wrestles with racially and religiously motivated violence, <clears throat> stir the hearts of your people to value every life. Strengthen first responders, preserve them through the traumas they face for the sake of others. Shelter all fleeing violence or persecution, especially in Afghanistan. We ask you to make a way for MB and all remaining Afghans seeking safety. Shield all Afghanis from further harm. Protect all Lutheran disaster response personnel and motivate the faithful to support their efforts to save lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Merciful one, for all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit, we praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or any illness, and that all may be healed. We pray for Erlene Zimmer in rehab for treatment and for Sue Ivan Jack's friend, Claudia Waite, <coughs> waiting for surgery to repair damage to her right knee and ankle and leg. We ask your healing presence to be with seven-month-old son, Everett Fitgatner, continuing to recover from liver transplant surgery. Come quickly to help David Primus family members his cousin, Doreen Walters, as she prepares to receive chemotherapy. His niece, Ashley, as she prepares for breast cancer surgery and other family members in need. We pray for Stephanie Truex's cousin, Scott, for strength of body and mind during chemo treatments. We pray for Mary Anthony's brother, Alan, and Karen G's mother, Yana, that both might receive the healing they need. Surround all for whom we pray with sustaining grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Sustaining one, for all who volunteer for the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Strengthen and encourage greeters, ushers, office volunteers, altar guild, counters, council members, committee and group leaders, singers, innovators, nurturers, and all who serve with generous hearts and work to build a more just society. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For what else do the people of God pray? For Kathy Hebert Manning. For Rochelle. My friend Lauren in hospice. My great nephew Jeff. Mary protect the seventeen missionaries kidnapped and raped. Risen one, we thank you for those who have shaped your church and shared your gospel. Through the witness of your saints, continue to inspire us with hope until we are all gathered at your eternal feast. Lord, 
in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, and also with you. I would like you to stand and face the center and look at the faces as if you were on Zoom. Those of you who are on Zoom are already doing this, but look at one another and share the peace of God just like we have been on Zoom. <laughs> so that we hear everyone's voices. God's peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you. I think I'm going to miss that as the Zoom part, you know, getting to see every single person's face so clearly and to hear every voice. And I just want to say again what a celebration and what a grace it has been for all of this time during the pandemic, the generosity of spirit and kindness and resourcefulness and collaboration that all of you have shown to one another has just been amazing and to be celebrated. So thank you very much. And thank you for the ways that you have offered your resources as well as time and energies. Um, in, in so many ways, we've continued to do work here at the church and continue to support one another. And your faithfulness in your giving has allowed a lot of that to, trans to transpire. So thank you, all of you, each and every one of you, for the ways that you have been so faithful throughout this time. We continue in prayer. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts we offer, which you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. As we share it, as, as we share this communion meal, uh, please take your communion package there. Have it handy for yourself as we get going. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord of our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and gracious God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of Christ, your sacrificing servant, you call us to follow in costly service to you and to our neighbors. Together with centuries of followers, we offer our lives willingly carrying the cross you give us and pray to become holy what you make of us in this meal, Christ's body for the sake of the world. And so with the choirs of angels, the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup, again gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to each one, saying, Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all the people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Together we announce Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Amen. And just like we have been doing as our practice, if you would lift up your bread and share it, looking in the eyes of a neighbor, not just to me, but to one another. And we announce the good news, the bread of life given for you. The bread of life given for you. The cup of salvation given for you. The cup of salvation given for you.
Take a moment to uh, have your picture taken, and on your way out the door, the, there should be a half sheet or a sheet of paper that has announcements and prayer concerns on it for you to use throughout the course of the week. Go in peace.
Thank you. 